Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jericho Congregational Church. I'm Reed Sims, um, one of the deacons that serves you, and uh, happy to be here with you. Um, I have a few announcements before we read the uh, call to worship. Uh, today, for the first time, the nursery is being staffed. If you have kids that need to be there um, at any point during the service, please feel free. They're out this door and turn right, uh, and you'll either see or hear the nursery. Uh, coming up June 20th, there's a graduation happening on Sunday. Um, I, I mean, it's the Sunday service celebrating graduates. So look forward to that. Um, also, as of today, we have increased sanctuary seating. For the first about two-thirds, maybe except for the back three or four rows, you can just sit down as uh, everyone did before. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, an announcement from Peter about middle school. The middle school Bible study is welcoming the incoming fifth graders to uh, join. And the first day for that is Tuesday, June 15th at 6.30 p.m. And it's over at the Sunday School building. And uh, just a reminder, parents of all the middle school schoolers are welcomed and encouraged to attend this initial meeting. And our psalm today to call to worship is Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore.
the name of the Lord, the Father who has made us, the Son who has saved us, who rescues, has rescued and is restoring us, and the Spirit who dwells within us. Let us, let us sing to the Lord. Let's continue by singing his praise and speaking our praise for him um, through our prayers of praise this morning. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your enduring love and your amazing grace about which we have just sang. 
And Lord, we want to lift our praise up to you this morning. Father, we praise you that true satisfaction and contentment can only be found in you. And Lord, we also recognize this morning that we have fallen short of your standard of holiness. And it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can come before you. Please take uh, just a moment to silently confess your sin before the Lord. And join with me this morning in the unison prayer of confession, which you'll find on the screen behind me here. Holy Lord, We are guilty of pride and unbelief, of failure to find your mind in your word, of neglect to seek you in our daily lives. Our sins and failures turn into accusations, but they shall not stand. For we lay them all now on Christ, our sacrifice and advocate. Lord, subdue our weaknesses, granting us grace to live above them and not to be mastered by them. Rule over us in liberty and power. We praise and thank you for your wisdom and love and for those times when we receive your refining. Deliver us from every evil habit, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in us, everything that prevents us from taking our deepest delight Amen. Hear the assurance of grace from Romans chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This time I invite you to join me in lifting up uh, the needs, uh, whether they be personal or for our congregation, uh, and, and requests before the Lord. Um, I invite you to, to join in, in bearing these requests uh, as a community this morning before the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we, um, we do lift up... Um, our requests before you this morning. Lord, we, um, we think of several individuals in our community. We just want to lift up uh, Luke and Angela Moultrup to you um, with their baby coming 
tomorrow, hopefully, uh, we ask that you would provide for us safe delivery and for wisdom for all those caring for mom and baby. Lord, we also pray for the Pete's new grandson, Lincoln, who's still in the NICU in Massachusetts with feeding and breathing problems. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray that you would strengthen the muscles in Lincoln's neck and bring peace to mom and dad, Rachel and Josh. Uh, Give skillful hands and perceptive minds to those who have been entrusted with Lincoln's care and do bring complete recovery to this child. Father, we pray for Vermont and for all of us as we emerge from the pandemic. Lord, we are grateful for the dramatic decrease in cases. We do pray for wisdom and discernment in decision-making for our leaders. Lord, that they would receive wise counsel. We do pray for your hand upon our church, Lord, and and us, uh, your people, as we gather together again. Lord, help us to love one another and our neighbors well, to honor one another above ourselves. Lord, we also lift up our youth, uh, Lord, that that, um, they would stand firm in their faith, especially as they face opposition. I pray that you would help us to give them the tools that they need uh, and an example to follow as we all follow Lord, grant each one of us the joy of a life surrendered to you and peace of sin forgiven through the power of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite uh, Asher and Ezra up front to help lead us in the Apostles' Creed this morning.
want to invite you to open up to the letter of First John this morning, chapter 3, as we uh, study God's word together. And on Communion Sundays, the first Sunday of every month, we have this opportunity uh, to recite that covenant of worship. We're going to come to the Lord's table after the sermon this morning. And all of these things rehearse for us this, this reality that we are one family. We're one people together uh, in and through the person of Jesus Christ. I'm really grateful uh, to Chris and Christine and their family who shared last week and shared that, that truth uh, again in, in a different dimension, the mission of, of creating a family, creating households that welcome others to know the agape love of Jesus Christ for us. I was encouraged by what they shared. I was also encouraged uh, to speak with several of you throughout the week and to hear how their message challenged you uh, and how you also desired and expressed what would it be like to be families, individuals that, that walk alongside one another together? What would it be like for JCC to be a family that God has created and is continuing to call together from, from new places and extending that agape love to one another? So we think about what it means to belong to the family of God and, and for that to be a core part of our identity. It brought to mind uh, a family that Katie and I have known for many years. We first met them overseas. Uh, they live in, in Canada now. But they are, are a family that's expressed that agape love, that, that missional sense of identity by welcoming many into their own family. I think they have... Katie can get, is it 13 or 12? They have 13 kiddos now, over half of which uh, have been adopted into their household. And many years ago, they uh, were waiting for four of those children to be brought into their household. They were in the process of adopting uh, four siblings from Ethiopia, four brothers who had been orphaned. And as part of the, the process, one day a social worker had to come to their home to do uh, uh, a visit, right? Uh, what, what do they call this? Uh, a home visit to basically interview the family, all of the children, and, and get a sense of is this, is this family ready to welcome these four boys? So the social worker asked a number of questions, and at one point she came to what was one of their youngest uh, children at the time. He was five or six. And she asked him what it would be like to have four new brothers who had a different skin color than his own. Was he ready to do that? Now, he actually already had two siblings from, from a different ethnic background than his own. And so he could speak from some experience. And he said, yes, I'm excited. I can't wait for these brothers to come join our family. The social worker probed a little further. And she said, well, that's wonderful. You're, you're excited. But, but imagine with me if you're at school one day and you're playing on the playground. And maybe some other kids on the playground notice that you and your brothers and sisters look different. What if they begin to make fun of you or your brothers? What if they begin to call you names? And this five or six year old boy with, with perfect seriousness looked back at the social worker and he said, I would say to them, in the name of Jesus, be still. <laughs> and then I'd get a rope and tie him up. <laughs> and I'd let him sit there until they would apologize for their behavior. Now, children, I think, have an ability to perceive the nearness of Jesus, to trust the help of Jesus, to invite him into their daily lives in a way that sometimes we lose sight of, we, we distance ourselves from as adults. I think one of the, the strange paradoxes of the Christian faith, what it means to grow into Jesus Christ, is that for us to mature, for us to grow up, Jesus says we're actually meant to become more like children in some respects. To be in Christ, to move into Jesus, is in many ways to become more like a child. 
Thankfully, we have some help these days. Someone told me after the service last Sunday they thought we might have had more kids in the sanctuary than we did uh, adults over 18. So we've, we've got this army of children to help us understand what does it look like for us to grow into, to recover our, our childlike identity of faith in Jesus. I want to open up to the letter of 1 John chapter 3, which speaks to these truths this morning. Let me pray for us as we open God's word together. Lord, we, our, our, our minds, our, our spirits, all of who we are, our souls, sometimes can't even comprehend the goodness of this simple truth that you are our Father and you love us before all things. Before the creation of the world, you chose us to belong to you. Lord, may the words of my mouth as I preach from these three verses this morning, may the meditations of all of our hearts, whether we're two months old or 82 years old, Lord, help us to be pleasing in your sight, to hope deeply in the truths they convey to us. And may they change us. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to read uh, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. And I want to invite any kiddos who are able to read the words on the screen behind me. If you want to just stand up where you're at. And I'm going to, I'll, I'll help lead us in this reading. But if you'd be willing to read alongside me from where you're at. Let's just add your voices as we read verses 1 through 3 together, okay? If you're willing to do that, feel free to stand up. You don't have to, okay? Ready? Let's read. I'll start us, and you can just follow with me out loud, all right? 1 John 3, verse 1. See what great love, you guys can read with me. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Thank you. You can sit back down. Great job. Sometimes I I wonder if John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, might have been like the early church's first youth pastor or, or children's minister. Because in his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and even in the Gospel of John, He has this great affinity for calling uh, those who belong to Jesus children. He uses that term children uh, upwards of 20 times just in his short three letters in the New Testament. And you get the sense that when John uses this term, sometimes he calls them beloved children or even little children. It's not a a term of condescension. He's not speaking down to them or patting them on the head, right? It's a a term of endearment. And it's, it's a term that is a reminder to God's people of who we really are. It's an expression of identity. Children of God. And if you can remember actually back to the week right after Easter this year, after we We moved our way through John's gospel. That week after Easter, we actually came back to chapter 1 in John, the gospel of John. And you'll remember that that there's that great prologue where it says that the word became flesh, right? And came into our world, full of grace and truth. And John says that whoever received Jesus, whoever was willing to bring Jesus into their heart, into their life, in, in faith, that they would have the right to become children of God. The right to to be born again in a new way, John says in his gospel. So there's this, this very real sense that the beginning of the gospel, according to John, 
is to believe that we have God as our Father and that we are his children. And so he, he comes back to that truth here in 1 John chapter 3. And in verse 1, he says, Remember that you are beloved children, and you belong not just to any old dad, but you have a father who wants to lavish his love upon you. You have a father who is extravagant in his love. And he says, This father we have is so loving he, he has to attach a, a Greek superlative, an adjective in Greek that, that's uh, potopen. And the adjective means literally from what country has this thing come? From what source? Where in the world can you find love as extravagant as this? This is the kind of father, John says, we have. Behold, he says, you are loved in a way that's it's hard to understand, in a way that defies the grasping of our minds. But you are children of God. How does that reality, the reality that we are children that belong to a father who loves us, how does that change who we are? I wonder if you've ever noticed when you're together with, maybe it's family members, maybe it's your really good friends, that people, when they know they're surrounded by people who love them deeply, there's this freedom that emerges for people to be playful, to be silly, maybe even to be a bit childish or childlike, even if you're 40 or 60 or, or 80 years old, right? When we know we are deeply loved, there's there's a sense that the child in us can, can come to life. We don't fear, it, you know, all the, the things we, we, we express our pretenses around, right? Those fall away when we know we are deeply loved. I wonder if you feel that freedom to be a child in the presence of God. Maybe you've experienced that. I would guess that many of us struggle to experience that on, on a routine basis. Not all of us are certain that when we come to God the Father, we're not certain that he's ready to lavish affection on us. We may have backgrounds and experiences with our own earthly fathers that make us wonder if instead God might be disapproving of us. We might wonder if we come into God's presence that we're, we're going to get a stern eye from God, a stern look instead of a father who welcomes us to come to him. When we're in the presence of God, sometimes we can be concerned with all the things we are not rather than the one thing John says we are. You are children of God whom he created and whom he loves. And John says, start there. Start with this basic truth. We are lavishly loved by God. And if you wonder, well, how do I know that? How can I trust that that's how God sees me as his child? Well, I think it's helpful to think and, and, and to recognize that John isn't gathering his data about, about God as a father or us as his children from his own experience as, as a child. John's not reporting to us about his earthly father here. We don't know what John's dad was like. Probably had some great qualities and probably had some limitations, like all of us. What we do know is that John wrote an entire gospel about the way he observed Jesus the Son interacting with his father. Right? John spent three or four years watching Jesus, the son, talk to his father, pray to his father, be loved by his father. We know that John was, was beside the Jordan River the day that Jesus was baptized and the heavens parted and the voice of God the Father spoke from the heavens and said, this is my son who I love. In this, in this son I am greatly pleased. We know that John was beside Jesus when Jesus said, 
Pray to your heavenly father and tell him what you need. You know why? Because God is like a father who loves to give his children good gifts. If you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask him for an egg, he's not going to give you a serpent, right? This is the father we have. And John knows that because he watched Jesus live it out before him. So John says we have to begin our discipleship. We begin our walk of faith as a Christian by accepting that we are God's children and that we are loved by him. That's where we have to start. We can't move into maturity until we believe that deeply. But he says in the, first, uh, the second half of verse 1 here, that if we live as children who belong to God, it might also cause us to stand out. He says that when Jesus came into the world, when he lived out of this incredible freedom of what it meant to be the son of God, who was loved by God in this incredible way, the world didn't know what to make of Jesus. Right? There was a, a disequilibrium between Jesus and the rest of the world. And we might also experience some of that disequilibrium, like we don't fit entirely in this place. But John says that's also an indication that there's this beautiful change that's begun in us, a kind of transformation. Look at verse 2. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know this. That when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Verse 1 tells us, begin with this truth. You are, present moment, the children of God who God loves. That's our present reality. Verse 2 wants to tell us about who we will become as God's children. And there's part of that reality that we can know, and there's part of it that we can't know, John says. When we decide to step out and start following Jesus, we don't know what God will use to mature us or to change us. It's like kind of moving into a spiritual adolescence. And adolescence is typically a time in our life that holds surprises, right? Things we we didn't anticipate. I think I've shared a story before of a, a young girl I knew. I knew her family as part of a church I was serving in. And the church had this class that was designed for preteens to talk about the, the changes that puberty would bring alongside their, their parents. Everybody loves those classes, right? And they talked about how our bodies begin to change, how our emotions begin to change, talked about how our relationships start to change in those years. And they got to the very end of the class, and and this young girl, 10 or 11 at the time, she came to her mom one day in tears. And she said, Mom, I've been listening to all this stuff, and I've been thinking, and I've been praying, and I've made a decision. She said, okay. Decision about what? And she says, well, I'm not going to do that. And she said, you're not going to do what? And she said, I'm not going to do puberty. I'm I'm just not going to do it. I decided I'm just going to stay like this from now on. And her mom had to gently explain to her that we don't have that option, right? We're meant to keep maturing, to keep growing, to keep being transformed in that way. In the same way as those God has called to be his children, we we don't get to opt out of what we will become. We don't get to choose what the years ahead of us are going to be like. When we start following Jesus, some of what's ahead of us will be joyous. Some of it will be deeply affirming of who we are. And other parts are going to be hard. Other parts are going to be awkward. Other parts are going to ask us to grow in ways that that we wouldn't readily volunteer for. But if there's one thing, John says, that we can count on, if there's one thing we do know for sure about our future, it's that we are going to be changed says, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We will be exactly like Jesus in every way. 
We're going to be children who look exactly like God's son. And take, take a minute to, to close your eyes for a moment, and I want you to imagine that promise. Imagine what it would be like for you, present day you, to one day look like Jesus, to be like him. Imagine you possessing the mercy, the patience, the kindness of Jesus. What would that look like in you? Imagine one day you embodying Jesus' love for truth and for justice. Imagine you approaching God the Father one day in the same way Jesus does now. You can open your eyes, but this is the, the, the promise of the scriptures. The scriptures say this is our future. This is where we're headed. God is committed to bring that change in every single one of us. It's not an option. We're going there. So we are children lavished by God's love. We will be children exactly like Jesus. But there's this in-between space, right? Between who we are now and who we will become when we are fully like Jesus. And that is what verse 3 wants to speak to today. It talks about the way that transformation happens. John says, so all who have this hope in him, all who have this hope in Christ to be his, his brothers and sisters, to be like him in every way, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. What's John talking about? Purity is not a word we spend a lot of time thinking about, most of us. It's not a key or, or, or uh, you know, buzzword in our contemporary culture. But in the ancient, word, ancient, word, ancient world, purity was typically a word that had religious associations. It was connected to the worshiping life, whether you were a pagan or whether you were a Jew or whether you were a Christian. And to be pure... Or to purify something meant to set it apart, to set it aside, to make it available for worship, right? To be used in the temple, typically. And so sometimes it was an instrument that had to be purified in some way by washing it or, or, or dedicating it in some ceremony. Often it was the priests themselves, right? They had to be purified. They had to go through these series of ritual cleansings and washings. And those were a sign to everyone else that they were making themselves available for worship and, and to serve God in that holy place, in that set-aside place of the temple. Now, John's not asking us to spend all day washing our hands or showering ten times a day to be holy or pure. But he is talking about setting aside, setting apart our lives. In the same way that the priests made themselves available to God. And the thinking here is that if we hope to be exactly like Jesus someday, then that future hope should inform our present moment. Let me say that again. Our future hope makes us different people today. As commentator Leon Morris says, to know God, to know God's love for us, does not bring complacency but brings purity of life. So John says, to hope in God is to, to purify ourselves, to make more and more of who we are available to the transforming work of God. It's not to expect perfection. John doesn't say here, we are perfect today. He says we have reason to hope, reason to, to join God in the hard work of being more and more like Jesus. Hopeful in the way that when we fail, we screw up, we admit our faults, we don't beat ourselves up. But we remember that we have a loving Father who wants to keep us growing, keep us maturing, keep purifying who we are. Imagine you met someone who said, I hope to be an Olympic swimmer someday. That's my goal. 
what would you expect of that person? Right? Probably they'd be at the pool three times a day. Right? They'd be training in a certain way. They'd be eating in a certain way. They'd be conditioning in a certain way. They'd be preparing themselves for that hoped-for future. But what if you discover that this person who wants to be an Olympic swimmer went to the pool like once or twice a month? <laughs> right? That wouldn't indicate uh, you know, a, a very sincere or deep hope. It would, it would seem like kind of a pipe dream. Right? Our future hopes have to have present consequences. How do we allow our hope of who Christ is to change who we are today? I want to invite you to do that in a specific way as we come to the Lord's table. In just a minute, you're going to be given an invitation. We're going to bring the gifts of God to you, the people of God. Right? You're going to get the, the body and the blood of Jesus. And that's an invitation for you to belong to Jesus, to be moved into Jesus, right? to become more and more like him through his grace, through his love for us in those gifts. But as you receive those gifts of grace, they're also gifts of hope. And I want you, as you hold them in your hand and you wait to take them, I want you to think about one area today where you desire to be transformed. One area in your life at the present moment that you need help hoping more deeply in, being purified more deeply in. Don't pick 10 things. Pick the thing you most desire to see Christ grow in you. Maybe it's your temper. Maybe you easily get angry. Maybe it's an addiction of some kind. Maybe it's a fear that, that, that sort of haunts you. Maybe it's a criticism that you can't quite leave behind. As you come into the presence of Jesus, not just alone, but corporately today as the family of God, I want you to imagine with hope what it will be like one day to be transformed, to be like Jesus in that one thing you're asking for today? What would freedom from that addiction look like? What would freedom from that fear look like? What would freedom from your impatience or anger or anxiety look like? And ask God to strengthen your hope in that place today. So I want to invite our deacons to come forward who are serving communion this morning. Invite Pastor Pete up. Communion at JCC is an invitation, and it's, it's given to all who have expressed faith in Jesus Christ, who des desire to follow him as, their, as his disciples. Um, so we will bring the elements to you, and as you receive them, remember how Jesus marked this meal. Let me find the scripture here in Mark 14. says in Mark 14 that Jesus gathered his disciples on the last night of his earthly life, gathered them into the upper room, and as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. And he also took a cup. And he blessed it and gave thanks to God for it. And as they drank for it, from it, he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for his people. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. God, hope oh, for you, his people. Take and receive them now.
This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. Just as Pastor Dave read, similarly in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to his disciples as he serves the bread and the cup to them, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. shed for you. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, it has been too long since we have joined together as your people.
feel free to stand. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cross. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. 
Gibson. Can I grab your mic? All right. You want to hold this one? I've got the mic. Is that turned on? Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. Just talk louder, right? You ready? What's that? You don't think it's on? There it is. Okay, you ready? May the Lord bless you, right? May the Lord, Lord bless, bless you, you and keep, keep you, you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and may he give you his peace. Go in the name of God the Father, Son, and Spirit today. Amen. Amen.